I always have trouble remembering Karen's official position title, so very nice of her to leave this here for me. <laughs> um, I'd like to welcome Karen Brisbane, who's the Lenkey Corporate Partnerships Facilitator. So she can run through what corporate and, part, corporate and partnerships involves. Thank you very much. Now, I know you've sort of been afternoon tea, it's in the afternoon, warm room, so I'll try and keep it short and sweet, and any questions you can ask me later on. Um, my name's Karen Brisbane, as Tom mentioned. I started off as a project officer for Landcare in the Golden Valley, and then went on to a coordinator and facilitated a network for 10 years. I've uh, been involved with Landcare 14 years, I'd say now. Um, and now I'm in the, doing the statewide role. So I go to cover all 10 CMAs, with Landcare Corporate Partnerships Facilitation. So part of that role is linking up projects that Landcare groups like yourselves have with corporate or philanthropic or trusts. Also letting you guys know about the other funding that's available other than state and commonwealth, because most of you will have applied for state and commonwealth funding. Hands up any groups have applied for philanthropic or trust funding. That's a Four, five, it's not too bad, but there's a lot of trusts and funds out there for you to apply for, alternatively to state and Commonwealth funding. It's just a matter of being organised. Hands up, actually, now I'm going to get to stand up. How many groups actually have an action plan, a strategy of some sort in relation to projects? Hand, stand up, stand up. That's a really good number. Well done, guys. I'm impressed. That's fantastic. You'd be surprised how many times you ask that question in a group and they don't have a project or a plan, don't have a future direction. And that's partly what corporates and philanthropic really require of a community group they want to deal with, is that future planning. They can see where you're going to go to in the future. They can actually build partnerships with you and create a project with you and take you forward. Uh, corporates uh, tend to want to have long, more long-term partnerships these days rather than short-term. And that project planning shows that you're forward thinkers. So well done. Give yourself a round of applause. Very good. Now, <laughs> um, as part of a corporate partnership role, I also facilitate not just funding, but there's other types of support a corporate or philanthropic can provide you. Uh, from a corporate point of view or a business point of view, you, an example could be an accountant could offer you a reduced rate for doing your a, um, AGM statement of per statements or your audit audits. You could um, get items donated. You could have somebody that digs your holes for doing fencing so you don't have to dig them. So there's all the, always something else out there that you can actually lead into. If you've got a project, think outside the square. If it's a big project, a lot of corporates and philanthropic trusts tend to be smaller buckets of money. Um, I think that's why we go for the state and commonwealth, because they tend to be bigger buckets. But the smaller buckets of money are very valuable as well. So if you've got a big project, think about maybe making it into smaller projects and applying for individual um, types of funding for your bigger project just to make it complete. Um, corporate philanthropic, it's a hard economical time at the moment. So it's not always going to be possible to get the funds that you need at the time to do a full project. So by dividing up the project, you've got more chance of getting part of it funded and done, and then you can move on to the next stage. And if the corporate's impressed with you, like good reporting on time, lots of good communication, they will like to continue, tend to like to, that, to continue that relationship. So when I say in a timely fashion and good reporting, I mean, and communication, I mean, you know, once a month if you've got a, We'll say, I, I deal with um, Bunnings quite a bit. I've got 12 Bunnings stores across Victoria working with individual projects at the moment. Um, I communicate with each of those Bunnings stores at least every six months. And I talk to them and see, to see how they're going, have a chat. Most of them I've got a personal relationship with now with the exact activities coordinator. There's always somebody within the organisation that you would need to deal with. So it's probably a community liaison office or it could be a grants person. It depends on the size of the organisation you're dealing with. If you've got a big corporate organisation, they will actually probably have somebody designated to dealing with the community. And that's the person you have to talk to and create that relationship with. If you create a relationship with that person, they're the ones that are going to see your project to start off with when you write a funding application. They're the ones you need to impress. 
And when you get, and if you have a chance, give them a chat, have a chat on the phone, you're actually selling yourself and your project and your land care group at the same time. You're creating that familiarity and you're talking to them, giving them a face or a name and a voice to associate when an application comes across your desk. So I'm going to, I'm sure um, Alex over here can probably add quite a bit to what I'm saying. I'm just going to add it, be very brief as possible. But if you're applying for a funny application, what's the first thing you have to do? Eligibility. What's the other one over here? Yep. I would like to think that you've actually done the project planning already because most of you got projects in place. <laughs> so if you've done the project planning, good idea. Before any funny application comes out, you should have actually project planned anyway. If you're not going to just... Land care groups tend to be reactive to a funny application rather than being proactive as actually doing that planning before a funny application comes out. You need to develop your plan and choose a funny application that suits your project rather than the other way around. Otherwise you find that you're filling in a funny application, you have no idea what you're doing. You're doing it last minute, you're getting it to the funders right on the dot of five o'clock on the last day and it doesn't look good to them but it also means there's a lot more work for them in that last week as well, the last day. And being a person that's actually sat on a few um, revisions of fund funding applications, you can tell the ones that haven't done any previous work. They're usually done at the last 24 hours of the project, they've missed words, they haven't filled in appropriate places, and it's really basically a waste of your time filling an application that's not even going to fit past that first criteria of filling all the blanks in, basically. So one of the suggestions I do have, read the eligibility, read the criteria. Read the exact words in the criteria, and if you don't match those criteria or your borderline, ring them. Now, as a coordinator, when I was a coordinator for the Golden Murray Land Care Network, it's one of my downfalls. I should have rung more often when I was unsure if my project or the Land Care Network's project fitted their criteria, because I could have made, saved myself time, days filling in a funny application. <laughs> um, so if it doesn't fit, just don't worry about it. It doesn't fit your project. You just miss that funding round. You go and look for something else somewhere else. And there is a lot of funders out there for projects. Up the back there's a, well that was done in 2000, November 2011, and I'm going to update it this year, hopefully. It's a Landcare Community Grants Guide. Now that has fund uh, trusts, uh, foundations, state and Commonwealth funding, as well as organisations, somebody mentioned it earlier, about using volunteers from corporates, corporate volunteering. So there's actually a couple of pages in there of corporate organisations that allow their staff to do volunteering, whether it be one day or two days a week. So it's, it's out of date, but there's not a lot that I know of that's changed. And each of them have got a website attached to them. So if you're uncertain, you find a project, a funder, um, funny application that might suit you, look on the website, see when the closing date is and work towards that closing date. Always allow yourself about at least a week or two at the end of writing a funding application because what are you going to do? When you finish writing your funding application, before you send it in, what are you going to do? So? That's one way of doing it. Yep, one more thing. Anything else? Get somebody else to read it. That's right. Because you know what you're talking about and the person at the other end has no idea what you're talking about. So it's good to have somebody else read it and say, well, I have no idea what you mean here. And you think, well, I mean this. Well, it doesn't say that. It also means you've got to link up what you've said in the project brief, what's actually in the content and the outcomes, and what's in the budget. You'd be surprised how many projects that get to the end of the budget and they talk about fencing and weeding and stuff and they didn't see anywhere in the, the project brief and outcomes where they're going to be fencing. Or, you know, so, sorry? didn't read it. <laughs> but it's, um, it's one of those things that it, it's an accident. It's not done on purpose, but you're, trying, you're thinking 100 miles ahead. You know exactly what you want to put down on paper, and sometimes it just doesn't come through. So you're going to get somebody else to read it before you put it in, and ideally it would be good to have it a week before the applications are due to go in. That way if you do have problems, you've given yourself an extra seven days, You've also got to be mindful that some of the applications, particularly state and Commonwealth, require you to get signatures of everybody that's involved, which takes time. 
Another one is sometimes they require letters of support. Now, those letters of support can't be any more than three months old, but if you're uncertain, ring up the funder because some differ. But mainly, it's, if they're older than three months, they ask you to write and get another one written. Um, if you need permission from landowners, so if you've got a project that involves 20 landowners and your funder says you need to have the signatures and agreement of all those 20 landholders, it's going to take some time to do that because you know yourselves, you're never going to see the people when you want them to see them and they're never going to be available <laughs> when you want them to be. Um, on holidays, calving, milking, hay season, cropping, whatever it might be. Um, I will say too, so I should have mentioned at the start, if you've got any questions, ask as I go along. That would be good. Um, other items for f some of the other items you could get support for is the volunteer. We mentioned it earlier. Volunteer support can be a great way of getting a project done without too much effort from your own land care group. You've just got to be able to coordinate it. Be very mindful that if you've got a corporate organisation coming out and helping you, you have to be very OHS savvy. And they will require you to fill out, in some cases, OHS documents. You'll have to do the, the break briefings for staff so they know what's safe and what's not safe. You'll have to have a first aid kit. You'll have to have the appropriate water, morning tea, afternoon tea, and everything catered for. Now, these are corporate organisations that are used to having morning tea, afternoon tea breaks, unlike farmers. Um, and they're, they're, they're coming out and helping you. They're not used to doing the work you're doing. So you need to describe exactly what you want them to do. You can't assume anything. <laughs> um, I did a Commonwealth Serum Laboratories came out and did an activity at part of the Bushfire Recovery Project in King Lake. And I actually had to provide photos of the dam and the area that they were going to uh, be working around uh, to ensure that there was no stock in the paddock whatsoever, just in case some of them got stampeded. They were the words. <laughs> um, they had to make sure that the area they were working was fenced off from the waterway and had to provide gumboots for everybody. But I got around that one. They bought their own gumboots. <laughs> Some of them actually went and bought gumboots specifically to put them on. So that was, yeah, that's good. That's good. But they had a great time. They turned up at 10 o'clock, had morning tea and afternoon tea, did a couple of hours work, had lunch, a couple of hours at work, and then they just went home. So you usually start 10 to 3 if, they get, if an all-day event with you've got corporates. You don't start at 8.30 and you don't finish at 5.00. <laughs> because I've got travel time um, and some of them do have personal and family commitments so you just need to be mindful to start on time and finish on time. Very important. Um, other activities you can get um, with the corporate volunteers, I've actually created a link between the men's sheds in some regions with Bunnings or Sporty Shooters Association. Um, one of the projects I'm quite proud of at the moment is Shepherd and Men's Shed have uh, get wood off the Sporting Shooters Association. Um, there's a big pile of wood of, um, to make nest boxes. The Sporting Shooters donate it to the Men's Shed. The Men's Shed make chewing nest boxes for us and they go out as part of the Conservation Management Network projects for the Rue Goldfields and the Broken Boozy. And they monitor, put the boxes up and they monitor the, the nest boxes. And the, the men, the Men's Shed, they're mostly vision impaired and they love seeing the photos, sounds a bit strange, they love seeing the photos of the, the animals that are in the boxes. And they say, oh, that's, that, that's got that wire in there, oh, we didn't tidy up the bit of wire, oh, look, there's a screw, there's a screw there. <laughs> they get really, really um, proud of themselves, the work they've done, that these animals are now living in their boxes. Uh, we're probably up to, the Shepherd and Men's Shed are probably up to probably about 60 to 70 nest boxes they've built over the last two or three years. And Bunnings have been donating the screws and the hinges and the glue and some wire. So it's been a great combined project. I just go and pick up the nest boxes and drop them off to the Conservation Management Network and my job's done. I've actually got a, a list now of about four or five organisations wanting nest boxes for different other species as well. And because they're built so well, they'll last for at least 10 to 20 years, I reckon, easy. They're made, made out of reply, uh, marine plywood and they're extremely thick. They're 25 mil, I think they're thick. Um, so they're great boxes. Um, I also have a, quite a few projects with the um, schools within the Port Phillip, Western Port Bay area, Pakenham, Scoresby, sort of that area. Um, Bunnings donate the wood to the school. The school kids do it as part of their woodwork class. And then Landcare, myself or a local Landcare person, goes down, 
gives them a presentation on the animal they're making nest, the nest boxes for. They, we do a bit of a handover and a thank you, and if we've got any freebies, like Bunnings usually bring all those, you know, those Bunnings straw hats. The kids get all their hats on and they get photos taken with the boxes. Um, and then we hand them, and then I take them over to the Landcare Group and put them, um, give them to the Landcare Group. In the particular one I've just done, Emerald Secondary College is actually going to be coming out and checking those, monitoring those nest boxes in 12 months' time after they've gone up. And they're for feather tail glider, for feather tailed gliders. Does everybody know how big a feather tail glider is? About 10 to 14 grams, you know, not much to them <laughs> um, from a body size. Um, and the school children were very upset. They thought, oh, the, the animal's not going to fit in that little hole. I said, it will, it will. <laughs> said, Are you sure? And this is over the phone. I said, yeah, I'm sure it'll fit in that little hole. It's fine. So I actually was fortunate enough to get a feather tail glider from the Banella Department of um, Deputy Office and uh, took it along and showed them. And they said, oh, it will get in, won't it? <laughs> so I also encouraged the schools to do some research in relation to the animals the boxes have been made for. And uh, that's been quite successful because the kids can actually say, well, I might have them in my backyard because I've got Banksias in our front yard. I said, well, you might. You never know. And because they're, so, they're nocturnal, you're not going to likely to see them, but you never know your luck. Um, other projects, I've got accountants doing books for land care groups. Um, we've just run um, certain groups have got a connection with an accounting firm. They've made that connection. They've said, would you like, can you do our books at a reduced rate? And accountants have said yes. And most of the time they'll do it for a limited time. It's usually about two to three years. Do it for free or a reduced rate or free. And after that they'll expect some payment. But it doesn't, you guys can actually ring your own accounting firms if you haven't got that sort of set up already. Um, talk to your local um, school, schools. Schools are great to do flyers and newsletters and posters and even to do media and do movies. And CDs, DVDs. Schools have often got students within their area that have got special skills or want to go in a certain direction and sometimes the curriculum doesn't allow them to do that. So if you're actually linking with your school and get students to do your DVDs, we've got um, Cohen who's um, a local lad out of Wanganui Secondary College. He's actually doing DVDs for the Golden Broken CMA, or sorry, YouTubes, sorry, not really up to this lingo. <laughs> <laughs> um, YouTubes for the Gone Broken CMA. So if you actually go onto their website, you see YouTubes that Cohen's developed, and he's only 16, 17, but that's the career he wants to follow. But he's, it's nothing in the school for him to do it, but the school allow him to take time off to do this extra activity, basically. And I'm assuming it goes towards accreditation, but I'm not quite certain there. But he's probably done about four or five now for the Gone Broken CMA, and they're very pleased with his work. He gets paid for it, so it's extra cash in his hand. But it's nowhere near as dear, dear as getting somebody that's professional out there that you know, costs two or three thousand dollars. So, um, other uh, activities you could probably get involved with is linking with your rotary or superannuation funds for volunteering are, are fabulous activities, or four wheel drive clubs or camping groups. We were talking a little bit before about the Masham Passion and um, linking with groups that um, are currently already meeting and we want to use their, their bodies, basically, to do work. So a great one is those organisations are currently already getting out there. So the Rotary Club of, um, there's a couple of Rotary Cubs, Clubs that come up to Broadford each year. Um, they actually grow the plants and they bring them up and they plant them out over a two day weekend. They camp out under the stars and they provide their own meals and so forth as well. And Landcare just provides the tree guards, stakes and the ground to put them in. And it works really well. They've done that for the last 10 years and the numbers just seem to grow. So there's about up to 60 volunteers that come out from Melbourne each year. Now, around this area, you'd probably have quite a few corporates you could link into without a problem. NAB have a regular um, volunteer um, system in place that you'd actually tap into. Um, be mindful when you're, if you're approaching a corporate organisation. Phil, am I boring you? <laughs> he was asleep, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> now I've lost my track of thought. What was it? 
NAB, yeah, NAB have a volunteer scheme, so you have to just register with the National Australia Bank with the head office in Melbourne. And if you say you're interested in getting volunteers for here, they'll make an, try and make an event with volunteers for, from your region. Um, who else is there? Trusts and foundations, there's a lot of them out there, but they're very, some of them are very specific about where they want their money to go to. Deductible gift recipient status? Okay. It's, it is, it takes about six months at least to actually apply for DGR status. And there is a changeover at the moment where some of you may be registered for the taxable charity concession. You should all be registered as a tar taxable charity concession. It doesn't cost you a thing, but it means registers you as a non-for-profit organisation in the environmental field. So philanthropics actually look at that as well. Deductible gift recipient status, if you're able to use somebody else that has it, and use that as an avenue, Landcare Australia Limited. Is everybody familiar with them? Do they know who they are? They've got a, a, um, they're nationally based, um, partly funded by DAF, and they uh, work, they've got an office in Sydney and one in Melbourne and a person that's part-time in Western Australia. They have DGR status, deductible gift recipient status, and they're willing for your organisation to go through them to apply, apply for uh, funds. But talk to them in advance because they're the names, their name has to be on the application and they're the ones that are very responsible for the reporting process. So they probably will become a, a sort of a, a memorandum, memorandum of understanding of some sort between your organisation and Landcare Australia Limited, so the reporting is done on time. Reporting is very big, big for trusts and foundations, but basically for everybody, but particularly with those. If you don't report and do it in a timely fashion, as you're specified, it only hinders yourself from getting any future funding. Um, I can't stress that enough. Um, yep. So the tax concession charity, TCC status is what um, was just being mentioned and deductible gift recipient status. And because um, trusts and foundations are set up as a tax vehicle here in Australia, it's not really always philanthropically um, motivated, it's a um, tax vehicle, they need to give those funds to an organisation that can provide them with the tax deductible receipt. Now, in Australia, because Victoria was the first place to establish um, trusts historically, lots of people put established their trusts in Victoria to avoid death duties in other states and territories. And because you're Victorian organisations, most of you, or operating slightly across the border in some instances, um, you've actually got more trusts and foundations to access than any other state and territory in Australia. So you are at, at an advantage. But in many instances you need, do need deductible gift recipient status and it is a long process with the ATO transitioning to the ACNC, which is the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission. But there are a couple of ways to go about it. One is to find a DGR status organisation and have them auspice you. But there are a couple of trusts and foundations, for example, the Pratt Foundation, who really like to fund sustainable agriculture because producing more food for them produces more plastic, which is their business. So they do like to fund food production. They don't like auspice because they actually want to know that their money is being managed by the people that they want to do the work. So other ways is to have a relationship with um, Landcare Australia particularly as a Landcare group. The other thing is that um, FRRR, can we lend our DGR status to community organisations when you are doing something that is broadly charitable purpose? Public good, environmental, social connections. So if you can't, don't get a good reception from, from Landcare Australia, talk to FRRR, we will happily, happily lend you the FRRR status uh, and funds can flow through us to get to you. There are some um, trust and foundations of Victoria, like the William Buckland Foundation and the RE Ross Trust, really strong emphasis on sustainable agriculture. William Buckland Foundation hands out about $6 million a year. They have three priority areas. One of those is sustainable agriculture. They are, they are always undersubscribed. Helen McPherson Smith Trust has a strong focus and on uh, environmental and sustainable agriculture, always undersubscribed. So they are there. The thing with trusts and foundations is they actually want to talk to you. So don't, please don't submit an application to them without chatting to them. They love, they want a relationship with you. 
It's one of those three R's that they really value. And the reporting, important, it's about storytelling. They want to capture your st story so their trustees and donors can feel good about where they've put their tax deductible funds. Thank you. Thank you for that, Alex. No, the FTLA do not have DGR status as far as I'm aware. And I've also been told recently that it's going to be harder to get um, from the Commonwealth Government. Unfortunately, I don't know why that is, but that's just what I've been told. Now, I think I need to wind it up. Don't forget the um, calendars over there. My business card's up there too. Um, I'm willing to come out and talk to networks and organisations. I've been out to Desiree's group and we did an AGM out there and did some brainstorming and gave them some project ideas. Um, but I'm willing to talk about funding, see how I can help you in any way. My role is a statewide role, role and you fit in with that. Thank you.